This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Developers, got some extra time on your hands? Use it to learn a new database. InterSystems IRIS allows you to choose your language, tools, and environment, so you can collaborate, build faster, and deploy more efficiently. Now's your chance to try out InterSystems IRIS, the fastest way to build applications. Ready, set, code. Visit InterSystems.com slash TryIris to learn more. For Software Engineering Radio, this is Akshay Manchale. Today, we have Jay Kreps, and we're going to talk about KSQL DB. Jay is the CEO and co-founder of Confluent. Prior to Confluent, he was the lead architect for data and infrastructure at LinkedIn. He's the initial developer of several open source projects, including Apache Kafka. Jay was previously a guest on SE Radio on episode 162, and more recently on episode 393. Jay, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So before we get into KSQL DB, let's talk about a few basics. Let's start with Kafka. What is Kafka? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So we we, we call it uh, an event streaming platform, but that kind of begs the question of what what the heck is uh, event streaming? And and so you know it really is kind of a new category of thing that's come around. Some people compare it to being a bit like a kind of message queue that that you send messages to and it kind of queues them up and sends them out, but it's a bit it's a bit more than that. So the idea is you know Kafka acts as a kind of distributed cluster. And you can read and write streams of events. And by events, I mean, you say something happened and it gets recorded as a kind of linear stream, almost like a array of these events that just keeps growing and growing. And the writes all go to the end of the array and readers can, can read along uh, in that stream. And so, you know, those, those events could be anything. They could be things happening in the business. It could be, you know, sales that are occurring, uh, you know, messages of all kinds. You know, so this is a very new thing. Uh, Kafka itself has become quite popular now. So it's, you know, it's out in the world, you know, really at large scale. We're, we're doing our Kafka Summit uh, this year. And, you know, it looks like we'll have over 25,000 people who are signed up and, and going to attend that uh, virtually. So, so, you know, it's really become a popular um, layer for building these kind of asynchronous event-driven microservices that communicate through these events, it's become uh, popular for building, you know, real-time low-latency pipelines for data that that you know stream things into uh, different data systems or SaaS layers or APIs, and and it's become you know kind of part of the the modern stack in in a lot of ways, and so so that that's kind of the basic concept. You know, you can interact with Kafka through a couple different APIs. There's these lower-level APIs where you would produce or write data. Uh, into one of these streams, there's a consumer API where you would, you know, read or subscribe to to data that's being written, and then then there's APIs which allow you to use pre-built connectors that uh, hook up and maybe capture changes occurring in a database or publish changes out into some data store or SaaS application. And there's hundreds of these pre-built connectors for different types of system and applications. You can kind of hook them up and turn their data into streams or take streams in Kafka and you know, send it off to other, other systems. And you know, then there's uh, stream processing APIs in Kafka, which allow you to take these streams of data and react or respond or process them as they occur. So you could imagine you know, maybe you have a stream of the sales that are occurring in some e-commerce application, and you could imagine you know, uh, triggering order fulfillment or counting how many sales you had by geographical region as, as those sales occurred. And so those are the different ways of interacting with these streams of data. And so that's, you know, that's kind of the, the 30 second in a nutshell explanation of, of what Kafka is. Great. So I keep hearing things like uh, Kafka topics. So what's a Kafka topic? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, topic is kind of a terminology we, we borrowed from the messaging world. It's really just the name for one of these data streams. So, you know, maybe I would have in this e-commerce application, I might have a sales topic. 
And there might be many ways that a sale occurs, right? Maybe it occurs on an iPhone app or it occurs, you know, through some backend system or it occurs, I, I don't know. And you can imagine each of those sales being published out to this topic, which means really just appended to that kind of infinitely growing array that I described. And that might trigger all kinds of activity on the back end. So there might be a system that does order fulfillment. And every time a new sale is published, it would react and whatever you know is needed to send the information off to a warehouse and get that thing into a box and get it sent off that it would be responsible for that. Maybe there's something that updates the information uh, for customers. Maybe there's something that updates uh, you know the kind of coupons and whatever and you know sets up the returns, whatever whatever it is that you would do. Maybe there's analytical systems that provide reporting that would need to update. They would all subscribe to that feed of sales and react to it. And, and so the name for that feed or stream is uh, a topic in, in Kafka terminology. Interesting. So what's different about Kafka compared to a message broker that moves data from a publisher to a subscriber? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, you know, we, when we were building in this area, the, there were a whole set of different kind of cues and messaging layers, you know, the, the kind of foundational technology differences in Kafka that make it a little different, uh, I'll describe, and then I'll describe kind of like from the user's point of view, what do you get that's different? So as a technology layer, what's really different is, you know, Kafka is storing persistent replicated uh, events or messages, right? And it can store them really for any amount of time and you can hold lots of them. And that means it, everything is kind of multi-subscriber, like any of these topics, it can have zero subscribers or consumers. It could have dozens, hundreds of subscribers or consumers. And so, you know, this the, this idea of really orienting around events, being uh, always multi-subscriber, being persistent, and then building around kind of a modern distributed system that allows this to scale out uh, horizontally and do so, you know, more elastically and dynamically. All of that's, that's fairly different from a traditional message queue, which is more oriented around, you know, individual servers that would hold messages where they would put them on disk only uh, if needed. And, you know, beyond that, you know, Kafka doesn't really provide a queue abstraction. When you read a message, it doesn't, you know, pop it off the queue. Instead, it has this kind of stream. And uh, it turns out that this is, you know, those qualities end up really important it, if you're trying to build a reliable, data pipeline that guarantees the delivery. It turns out it's really important if you're trying to hook up multiple applications or systems within a company and guarantee that they all get it. It's operationally very important just because you don't want something where if the memory fills up and it goes to disk, it suddenly gets 10 times slower and tips over. And for all those reasons, I think you know Kafka has ended up being a much better platform for large scale usage within a company. And then it, it also turns out, and this was you know part of our motivation, that this abstraction is a much better foundation for stream processing, for working with this data in real time. So if you think about it, the message queues, it's a pretty low level abstraction. You can kind of put a message in the queue, you can take it out, uh, but everything beyond that is kind of up to you to go figure out in your code. And a lot of the things we do with data, um, there actually are common patterns. And that's why databases, you know, they don't just have put and get, they have uh, also a bunch of functionality that allows you to compute things off of the data. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that when we talk about KSQLDB and stream processing. You know, it's very, very hard to build that on top of a traditional queue. And, and Kafka was really designed with that in mind. Actually, we started with the idea of, hey, it would make sense to do a lot more real-time processing on data. How would we do that? And then we realized, well, the first thing you need if you want, you know, stream processing is you need streams. And you need them at scale across the company. And that, that was actually what motivated a lot of the early Kafka development. With that information, let's jump into KSQL DB, which is our main topic. So what is KSQL DB? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I, I started to touch on stream processing. And you know, th this, you know, it's probably worth just describing what I mean by that and you know what the difference is from batch processing or more traditional mm -hmm. databases. So you know, I'll explain it by analogy. You know, the way databases typically work is they have kind of a pile of data. Uh, whenever you run a query, they actually need the data to be static and unchanging. And the query is, is just kind of at a point in time. And so a database would usually lock that table or have some kind of concurrency mechanism to get a view on that that doesn't change. 
it would scan over it and compute the results of your query and it would give it back. And so, you know, the assumption is that query is just a very transient thing and it gives you an answer at a point in time. Of course, that, that answer is potentially immediately out of date. It doesn't get updated, but, but that actually makes sense. If you're, if you're building a UI driven application, you kind of want to know the answer as of right now, you're not really, you don't really care what the answer is in the future in a lot of cases, although uh, even UI is, is changing a lot as we have these more dynamic UIs that, you know, get push updates sent to them. And so, but that, that's the traditional model for databases. And so the analogy, I think that makes it easiest to understand stream processing is, you know, in the US, they have a census that they do every 10 years. And the way the census works is they send these people out with uh, binders and they, they go door to door and they record everybody's name and address. And that's their way of counting how many people there are. And you can think of that as a kind of batch process, right? It's scanning all the data and it's saying, okay, here's a person, here's another person, here's another person. And then when you want to get an update on that, you have to kind of go back and you got to scan all the data again. And um, so if you, you know, if you explain that to a software engineer, they're like, hey, that's kind of funny. You know, I don't know if I would build it that way. You know, probably what I would do is I would record all the births and the deaths. And if you had that stream of births and deaths, you could keep kind of a running count of how many people there were, right? And um, that's exactly what stream processing is. So the births and deaths, those are events, right? Those are big events in, in people's lives. You can imagine having attached that all the information about the person who was born or who died, right? So everything you would want to know in a census, their uh, gender, ethnicity, whatever. And then you could imagine keeping a kind of running count on top of that that would say, okay, you know, now in Mountain View, California, we have 75,692 people, you know, a, a baby is born. Uh, now it's uh, 75,693, right? So, so that's, that's the fundamental idea behind stream processing. And you, you can think of it another way, which is just, if you have this Kafka cluster and it has all these real time streams of data, you want to do things with that. You want to harness those, calculate things, take one stream of data, translate it into something else. And stream processing is kind of how you do that. And so, you know, Kafka has a set of lower level APIs that help to do this. They help you to do real time uh, aggregation, a kind of continuous running count on data. They help you to do joins. So in our e-commerce example, maybe you have this stream of sales, but you also have information about the customer and you need to put those together for fulfillment purposes. Okay, like, hey, this sold, but where do I ship it? Well, I need the address. I got to join on the information about the customer. Maybe you're just doing simple filtering. Maybe you're looking for the sales that are above a certain amount. All the kinds of things you might do in a database. So there's, there's kind of low level capabilities for doing that in Kafka. And so what, what is KSQL DB? Well, that's really our attempt to bring this out in a more database-like format. So in a database, uh, you can run uh, SQL queries. And you know, a lot of us know SQL. It's, it's, a, it's not a perfect language, but it's an easy language. It gives a lot of the expressive uh, activity of what people want to do with data. And, and, and it, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily know if it was applicable to this kind of stream processing, but it turns out it is. It turns out it's actually a great way of doing real-time processing. And what we're trying to do in KSQL DB is really, in some sense, bring together what we think are the two sides of databases. One of these sides is really well developed, which is if you have a pile of data, can you do lookups and queries on top of it? And in fact, that's kind of the only thing we know in databases. But the other side is if you have a flow of data, can you calculate and update things off of that? And that's always been a little underdeveloped in databases. They have some features like triggers or materialized views that are, you know, kind of very simplistic, but, but it's not actually, you know, expressed uh, with the full power of SQL on those streams. And so an example of this would be in a data warehouse. You know, once you get all your data in the data warehouse, the data warehouse gives you all this wonderful query functionality to do aggregations and lookups and things on top of it. How you get the data in and how you get it into the right format is a little bit of a dark art, right? Like there's usually some hacked systems that shove things in, then you kind of load, you know, run some big batch processes on top of it. But you can imagine a different world, which is, you know, the data in the data warehouse is always up to date. There's queries that run on that data as it flows in. Uh, and there's queries that do lookups to run reports and so on. And that kind of illustrates, I think, the two sides of this query dynamic, the, you know, changing data as it flows and, and looking up data as, it's, as it sits. And in KSQL DB, those are represented with two concepts, um, streams and tables, and you can query both of them. 
And you know, a stream is this kind of continual set of changes, as you know, Kafka topic. And tables are aggregates we've calculated, right? Or you know, lookups. It's something that's keyed, right? So you might have a table that's all your customers by some primary ID, you know, ID, and you might have a stream of all the sales that occurred. In a data warehouse, they would call these facts and dimensions. They have this idea of facts, which is basically kind of events, although you can't really subscribe to them. And they have dimensions, which is the kind of stored data about customers and products and so on. So those are the concepts. And then, you know, we, we support this by having the idea of push queries and an idea of pull queries. So the kind of traditional query where you go do a quick lookup, that's a pull query. You're kind of pulling the data out. And the other kind of query is a push query. It runs as the data kind of pushes in uh, to the system. And by putting those together, it's actually really powerful. You, you can imagine use cases where you're kind of building some cache. Maybe you're taking feeds of data out of different data systems and putting together some uh, aggregate view of your customer or some prematerialized uh, view of data that you need to, to serve some use case. And that, that view gets updated every time the underlying data changes. And then you can do lookups against it uh, to get a particular row or value. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you say a pull query, when I do the same thing on a traditional database, is that the same as a pull query? When I say select star from table, is that what a pull query is in case equal DB? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And so, so the difference now um, with this kind of streaming query is that you can now have subscriptions that continue to update as the underlying data changes. So, so a, you know, traditional query is kind of a point in time thing. Like, hey, what's the value right now? But you could imagine for systems that are actually subscribing, you need not just the point in time, but also the ability to get all the changes. And so you might say, hey, give me the count of uh, the number of people in every city. But instead of just getting it right now and having it be out of date, um, you would get it and have it update as people moved between cities or as, as people were born or, or died. And that's, that's basically the idea of extending databases for stream processing for, for events and, and streams. So in that example, let's say I have a dashboard that is displaying the running count of people. It's just a single query that I write and the changes are just automatically coming into the client with a push query. Is that uh, the sort of the idea there? Yeah, that's that's the basic idea is that, is that you can, you know, both get a, a point in time lookup as well as, you know, continually, continually subscribe and calculate changes. So what's a table in case equal DB? Is that traditionally the same as what a relational database looks like? Um, does it have a schema and types and all of that? Yeah, that's right. So, so the, the type system and the SQL is, is very similar to what you would expect in a traditional database. It's just that now, when you, in addition to saying create table you know, with the appropriate attributes, you can also say create stream. And you can think of a stream as being like a kind of table of immutable data that, that has a strong ordering that's, that's only appended to over time. You know, effectively, it's it's like a fact table in a, in a data warehouse, and, and you know, a, a table in KSQL DB is very much like a table in Postgres. You know, it's something that typically has some kind of primary key, and you would insert into it, or 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 change it, or look look up from it, or modify it in a continuous way. And the key thing that KSQL DB allows is for you to go back and forth from streams to tables. So in that example I gave of, of e-commerce, you could imagine having this stream of all the sales that are occurring. You could compute off of that. You know, you, you could take that and you could take maybe also the, the stream of shipments of products that are happening. And using those two, you could compute what's my inventory on hand. And so the stream of shipments, that's like an event, right? Uh, this, this was shipped, this arrived. A stream of sales is like also events, this sold. But inventory is actually a table. It's like for each product, how many of these do we have on hand in each location? And it's going up and down as those shipments are occurring. And, and so you know, the, the cool thing about this is it allows you to go back and forth between these, this idea of streams and this idea of tables. And I think it's actually a very powerful generalization of data, databases and, and how we work with data that, that really has a lot of applications. You know, we see the use cases being this kind of streaming data pipelines, like real-time pipelines where you're you know, capturing data from different systems and transforming it as well as like materializing these caches, use cases around security where you're looking for the bad patterns. But, but it's actually quite applicable you know, across a lot of different uh, use cases and systems. So what is the source for uh, KSQL DB data? Is it a consumer from a Kafka topic? Yeah, KSQL DB always works on top of Kafka. 
but it actually allows you to control the Kafka connectors as well. So I mentioned Kafka has this Connect API, and the Connect API is a way of building these simple plugins that either capture a stream of data from a system. So there's um, plugins for uh, MySQL or, or Postgres or, or Oracle. Um, there's plugins for different messaging layers. There's plugins for a lot of cloud data systems. There's plugins for um, different SaaS APIs. So it can either capture a stream or it can take a stream that's in Kafka and publish it out to some system. So you can imagine, you know, maybe you have a MySQL database and you're capturing all the changes coming in from that database and you're publishing it out to Kafka. Or you could imagine taking a stream from Kafka and loading it up into the MySQL database. So, so there's connectors usually in both directions. We call them sources and sinks. And so um, you know, to, to make these kind of pipelines easy, KSQL DB also allows you to control those connectors. So you can actually have a, a pretty end-to-end -end flow for, for streaming data where you say, okay, you know, connect to this database, capture all the changes, connect to this database, capture all the changes, take those streams, combine them in this way, you know, materialize this new table of, of data that is being computed off that, and now do lookups against that. And, and so it is actually kind of an end-to-end -end solution in this event streaming space. Whereas, you know, really before this, I, I feel like people had to piece together a bunch of different things uh, to get something. You know, there was some stream processing, which would do the transformation. There was, you know, Kafka, there was integrations with different systems. And then there's some database you would do the lookups against. You had to kind of wire all that together and figure out how to secure it and so on. And so this, this makes it a little bit simpler in that you really just have Kafka and KSQL DB to work with, and they're kind of built to work together and have a same, you know, a similar set of abstractions and security features and, and so on. So when you are ingesting data into KSQL DB, can you uh, have some sort of transformation from the source before you ingest it? Or is it a one is to one data with respect to what's in a Kafka topic uh, that you can just query differently? What's the difference there? Yeah, you know, typically people don't do a ton of transformation as part of that load. You know, you would you would typically do it afterwards in in uh, KSQL. But but yeah, we, we do support, you know, we call them single message transforms that allow you to, you know, do simplistic, you know, munging on a single row as it comes in. That, that ends up being important in some cases. There's some sensitive data you don't want to load or you want to uh, obfuscate or you want to encrypt in a particular way kind of on the way in without it ever being stored in the original form. So you can query KSQL DB like SQL, but is there any difference between uh, just regular SQL and KSQL? Yeah, it's, you know, the pull queries are, are certainly more limited. So, you know, at the moment it's limited to, you know, um, relatively simple lookups. We're, we're working on broadening that further uh, over time. You can imagine, you know, our, our goal isn't to really replace all databases with this. It really is for use cases around event streams where you would otherwise be gluing together multiple technologies. So if, if you have a UI driven app that's using Postgres, we wouldn't come in and say, oh, you know, stop that and use this KSQL DB thing. It really is in the case where you're trying to do things with streams of data around Kafka, where this can suddenly add a lot of simplicity. What would have been a bunch of custom code and integration between multiple systems can do that. So, so yeah, we, we are broadening the query features over time that do pull queries, but, but obviously, if all you're ever doing is pull queries, there's 101 databases to do that. The the magic here really is the the push queries, the kind of stream processing side of, of the equation, which is a feature which really hasn't existed elsewhere. Right now, there's no better time to learn a new database. With InterSystems Iris, you can build the applications you want however you want them. You can connect your systems, use any data model, and apply machine learning. So you can build data intensive and mission critical applications in no time. Level up your skills with InterSystems Iris, the fastest way to build applications. InterSystems Iris data platform. Ready, set, code. Visit intersystems.com slash try Iris to learn more. Can you talk about the uh, components that make up a KSQL DB system with respect to how it works in an existing Kafka deployment and how it fits in? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in a traditional database architecture, you have kind of commit log, and then you have these tables uh, that, that have your data represented in different ways. Effectively, this looks a lot like that, except that the commit log is now Kafka, and the, the tables are, are actually materialized in the KSQL DB cluster. 
So if in case equal DB, you would have a set of nodes. Those nodes, you know, read and write streams of data from Kafka. They may materialize it into RocksDB, which um, is not actually kind of a full database in the sense of having, you know, SQL and supporting remote access. It's an embedded key value store that just maintains the data format on disk. And so that's that's how the kind of indexes and tables are stored to allow lookups. And so so that that's how it works. And you know, this makes KSQL to be kind of elastically scalable. You can add uh, new nodes and they will take over part of the work of query processing uh, automatically. So you can kind of scale it out or, or scale it down elastically by, by adding or removing nodes from that cluster. And it, you know, it, it, it works similar to Kafka itself where there's a kind of partitioned workload. So you can imagine taking one of these tables and chopping it up into little pieces and storing those pieces spread across the cluster. And you can do that with uh, some replication so that you know if one of the nodes fails, it it doesn't uh, go away, but the the kind of long term store for all data is is in Kafka itself. The RocksDB instance uh, is really just kind of a, a cache, and so even if it's replicated, you know, it is just kind of a quick lookup index, not the kind of authoritative source, if that makes sense. So if you were to lose the instance of RocksDB, you could rebuild that data from your Kafka topics. Yeah. Is that yeah? That's exactly right. So so and it's common with stream processing. You may calculate a bunch of things and then want to recalculate them later. And you may you may indeed want to throw away all your data and kind of start over and and reprocess from the beginning as a simplistic way of, of getting there. So that's you know that that's kind of the basic architecture. All the actual processing and computation happens in the KSQL DB nodes. You know, Kafka is just being Kafka. It's it's reading and writing the streams and replicating them and, and storing them. So it's not it's not the case that these queries are kind of going off to the Kafka cluster and doing anything like that. One of the things we felt was very important was making sure that Kafka itself works really well as a multi-tenant system that can be shared across many teams and use cases without tipping over. Whereas uh, KSQL DB, you can do all kinds of complicated munging and you can have many KSQL DB clusters that feed off the same Kafka cluster. They can all share data but they don't you know, interfere with each other. If you do some kind of very abusive query processing in your KSQL DB instances, it won't, it won't hurt your uh, coworkers. And um, I think that's an important pro um, property for any of these things that go across teams is to, to think through how that you know, multi-tenancy architecture is meant to work. And so for us, it's you know, Kafka is the shared part and it does very simple, predictable things. KSQL does all the complicated stuff, but is meant to be you know, clusters that are not really shared across uh, teams and meant to be multi-tenant. Instead, you would give each tenant their own capacity. And it's actually a very flexible model. You know, typically in databases, if I give you your own database, you don't have access to my data. But because of this shared commit log at the center, everybody has access to the same stuff. Uh, it's just a, a question of how you index it and process it in different, in different clusters. Speaking of indexes, relational databases tend to have certain indexes. Can you create additional indexes on top of your massaged data that you're consuming from Kafka topics and ingesting into KSQL DB? Can you have indexes on top of that for faster lookups and all of that? Yeah, so we, we, we don't support kind of secondary indexes yet, but you, you can, of course, just materialize the data in different ways, which, which effectively serves the same purpose and is maybe more in the style of this kind of stream processing. We'll probably add secondary indexes just to make the pull queries simpler in certain cases and, and have less materialized data, but there hasn't been a big push for it yet. So KSQL DB sort of simplifies how you can access the data. Uh, KStreams, or the stream API on top of Kafka lets you do the same thing. So what's the correspondence between the two? Can you do everything that you can do with streams with KSQL and vice versa? Yeah, I would say you can do the vast majority. Obviously, with an open API that supports uh, code, you can do more than, than you could do in SQL. So the, the relationship is this actually, the streams API is a lower level set of kind of Java primitives for doing stream processing operations, joins, aggregations, filtering, you know, all, all the things you, you might imagine doing with data. You know, it, it looks like one of these, you know, kind of uh, fluent APIs where you chain together a bunch of operations one after the other. If you, you know, if you've used Java, the, the kind of streams interface in Java is similar to this where you would, you know, chain maps and uh, reduces and, and aggregates. And, and so it works like that, except it does this on 
uh, these infinite streams, not just finite collections, and, and does it in a persistent and partitioned and distributed and fault tolerant way. So that's what the streams API in Kafka provides. KSQL DB is actually built on top of that. So it, it uses those primitives under the covers, but it, it does do more than that. So it, it provides a SQL layer on top of that. It also it provides remote access so that you can run these kind of pull queries. You can you know send new queries to it. And then it also controls the Connect API in, in Kafka. So you can run uh, connectors and it brings both of those together. And so, so we feel like that really broadens the appeal. You know, maybe Java has what, whatever you want to call it, 40% of the programmer market, but, but kind of everybody knows SQL. And it's also just a lot less work to put together a SQL query than it is to kind of build and test a full Java application. So it's not really, you know, d depending on the use case, it's not that one exactly replaces the other. You know, for, for building kind of a very complicated custom set of business logic, there's a good chance you're still going to do that in Java. But for a lot of simple data transformations, materializing caches of data, you know, looking for the bad patterns for security, that's the kind of thing where you just want to write the query, just say what you mean, not not write a ton of code and compile it and deploy it and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's really where KSQL DB shines is those those kind of simple streaming use cases. So there seems to be like a trade-off between ease of use versus expressiveness of what you want to do uh, for expressivity, just use like uh, case streams and otherwise use case equal. I think that's exactly right. You know, you could, you could think of there being kind of a hierarchy here where the lowest level producer and consumer APIs that write streams, they kind of have all the power, you know, they, in Kafka, they have the transactional processing. In theory, if you're willing to write enough code, you can do everything with that. But that's a lot of code in most cases, and you would end up rewriting the same stuff over and over again. And that's where these the kind of connector API and streams API provide the next layer up in that stack. It's a little bit higher of an abstraction. It makes it easier to get you know correct results and reason about what happens if the machine fails in the middle of processing something. Um, but you do trade off you know a little bit of flexibility in in how you how you write that versus the low level read and write. And then one level up from that, uh, I think, is is KSQL DB. So the analogy you could use is, you know, uh, if you've ever used one of these key value interfaces uh, like RocksDB itself, you know, it's kind of very flexible and allowing you to work with data at a low level, um, probably more so than a SQL interface. But it's actually a lot more work for kind of simple stuff uh, that you might want to do than, than using a SQL database. Is there a notion of transactions within KSQL DB? Can I ingest a particular set of events only if a certain condition is satisfied? Is there, um, you know, an all or nothing sort of a guarantee and uh, traditional, you know, what relational databases have? Yeah, there, there is, although it's a little bit different. So, so since the domain is stream processing in, and the pull queries are mostly for looking up results, um, it's really about how can you guarantee the correctness of that processing? So, and you can imagine a lot of corner cases here. So, you know, what if, you know, a message was delivered and processed and then the, you know, the, the, the stream processing application died and then it kind of came back and it gets that message again, you know, what happens? So in my census example, where I was kind of counting uh, births and deaths, you don't want to, you don't want to double count a birth, right? And end up with the wrong, the wrong number of, of people in a given city. And there's a lot of corner cases like that that you could imagine. And you know, it's, it's very similar actually to the domain of transactions in, in normal databases. And the underlying Kafka APIs support a transactional concept. And, and so it works just like you would imagine a transaction. You say begin, you do a bunch of writes, and then you say commit. And uh, then all of those writes either happen together or they don't, they don't happen at all. And so the, the stream processing functionality in, in KSQL DB uses that. So it says, okay, you know, I'm, I'm working across these different topics and so on. I need to make sure that whatever happens, network glitches, the, you know, one of the nodes fails, uh, I still get the, you know, the correct output. In this case, correct output means the same output I would have gotten if nothing had gone wrong, right? And um, people often refer to this as exactly once semantics, meaning you get the same semantics as if the message had been delivered just one time, even though, of course, under the hood, you may send some message over network. You don't know if it got there. The thing fails. It comes back. It gets it again. It, you know, under the hood, many things are happening. You want to get the the uh, the same output you would as if everything worked perfectly. 
And, and so that's that's uh, supported within KSQL DB. And it's it's an important thing to, to be able to have that. You know, there, there have been a whole history of uh, stream processing layers over the last, you know, five plus years. And they've kind of built up functionality that makes it easier and easier to use and so on. A lot of the early ones didn't really have any um, real guarantees in this area and, or they had very weak guarantees. Of course, that makes it very, very hard to write any kind of important application on top of it. If you can't guarantee that you get the right output, then it's only really usable for things where the, the answer doesn't matter. And, and so, the, you know, that kind of guarantee is very important. It is end to end because you have to reason about what's in Kafka, you know, KSQL DB's part, how it gets out into the other systems that, that it might ultimately end up in as a destination. And so that, that is another part of the simplicity I think you can bring in this area by having a bunch of components that are built to work together. On the query side of things, can you join different tables, uh, different Kafka topics to get a result that you want? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the use case for that in, a, in stream processing, it isn't always obvious to people, but um, there's actually quite a lot of that. So, so one of the examples I gave was, you know, you have this stream of sales, but the sale in it, it probably just has your like customer ID, right? But a lot of what you would need to do to process a sale in different ways, you probably need a bunch of other information about the customer. Maybe you need their primary shipping address or whatever the case may be, or you probably need to join on that information. And so, so you could imagine the sale as being a you know stream of events. You could imagine the customer information as being a kind of table. You're joining that stream and table together. And so, you know, it supports all the combinations here. You can join a stream to a stream. So in advertising, you have clicks and you have impressions. And one of the problems is often trying to say, hey, which uh, impression, which which viewing of the ad led to the click on the ad? That's a kind of stream, join a stream to a stream, right? In normal databases, of course, you join tables. Uh, there's a lot of that. You might have streams, you, know, you might have streams coming out of different uh, databases where you're kind of capturing the, the feed of changes and you might want to aggregate all that. So a common example of this is where you have bits of data about your customer uh, spread over many different systems in a company. Any big company ends up with this problem where you're like, hey, we, we know a lot about our customers, but you have to go to 27 systems to figure out the answer. And you know that's an example where if you treat the changes coming into each of those records in each of those systems as a, as a kind of change log, then with Kafka Connect, it can kind of extract that from those systems and you have this feed. And then using KSQL DB, you can effectively, you know, produce this kind of streaming join that gives you the, you know, the end all be all, you know, record for each customer that has all the information together. And so that's, that's an example of a normal kind of table join, table to table join. So all these combinations of streams and tables are actually pretty useful uh, in this domain once you start to think about it. You mentioned earlier that it's possible to have multiple KSQL DB instances maintaining their own table or connection that can come and go. So from a client perspective, can I join on data that's on two different KSQL DB nodes? Is it there's a is there a distributed query of sorts or is it isolated to a single source? Yeah, yeah. So it, that, that's true both in two different ways. So, you know, a KSQL DB cluster is made out of multiple nodes and then you can have many clusters uh, working off of the same Kafka cluster. And so, so I, I was actually saying both things. So, so you could have, mm -hmm. you know, I could have my cluster, you could have your cluster. And then within my cluster, it's actually spread over multiple nodes. So the, the data itself is partitioned up. And of course you, um, you would need to uh, be able to join across different partitions. The actual join itself is performed locally. So it would reshuffle the data to get it into the same node to, to do the join. It's not doing like a remote RPC call for each lookup. So, you know, under the, under the hood, it would be uh, done locally. But, but yeah, you can join, uh, you know, different different topics together in different ways. So since you're using RocksDB as a backing storage layer, can you use RocksDB in conjunction with KSQL DB as a traditional relational database, create a classic table on RocksDB and then use the two things to sort of query, ingest, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, RocksDB itself, the, the DB in the name maybe oversells what it is to people. You know, it is just kind of a put, get, scan, uh, interface in C and Java, so it doesn't support any SQL or anything like that. So the you know the table concept is of course using that under the hood to store these partitions of data in KSQL DB, and you can combine the tables and streams in KSQL DB. But the um, there's not really a SQL interface to to 
you know, directly access the RocksDB part other than the, the KSQL interface itself. But I think probably the use case you would want to use that for, you actually can do in KSQL DB itself. So you did mention that KSQL DB has a schema of sorts where you can declare, uh, you know, columns and a primary key and you're consuming from Kafka topics. So how do you deal with changes in schema, schema from your upstream subs, um, publishers of data? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, so yeah, I guess like any uh, SQL layer, KSQL DB, it needs, it needs a notion of what the data is and that lets it get into the records and munge on them in a smart way. So, you, you know, you can, you can kind of express that just yourself by saying, hey, I assert this is what's in this data feed. Maybe, you know, maybe you have JSON records and you're saying, I'm, I'm saying it's going to have these four fields and that's the scheme of my table. Obviously, if uh, somebody upstream publishes mangled JSON, then you got a problem. Uh, so, so it does also support usage with what we would call a schema registry. So, so Confluent uh, produces something that maintains these schemas along with Kafka. And that's a way, it's actually a very important component for the usage of Kafka. I talked about the usage of Kafka across different teams. Obviously that only works if we all understand each other's bytes, which means we have to agree on the format. And so this, this allows you to maintain the format of data in common format. So um, uh, protocol buffers or Abro or, or JSON, uh, it'll store a schema for that. It'll check the data against that. And then you can express different compatibility rules. So you may have some Kafka topics where you say, hey, it's Wild West, put whatever you want in and good luck to whoever's downstream. The reality is for mm -hmm. important data, if you have a lot of applications building around it, you don't want to be in a situation where the person putting data in or the, the many teams putting people, data in have to go talk to all the teams downstream. It just gets really hard to organizationally maintain correctness in that world. So, so typically in those situations, you would enforce uh, some notion of forwards or backwards compatibility, you know, which, which control what you're allowed to do, right? So uh, the most restrictive would be you can't change it at all. The reality is in, in most businesses, the problem changes over time, you know, the, the software needs to evolve. So that's usually too restrictive. So, but you usually do want to have some notion of compatibility around, you know, okay, you can add fields, but you can't, you know, change the type on an existing field because that's going to break downstream code. It's going to break case equal, you know, DB, whatever, whatever is relying on the format of that. So you, you would want to use that schema registry to enforce these requirements. And that's actually quite common. This is a very popular uh, open component that, that we produce that, you know, is very commonly used with, with Kafka itself. Since you have a cluster of KSQL DB nodes, I can presumably write a query in different ways. If I go to a relational database and write a query, there's ways to sort of understand what the cost of the query is, plan, and uh, kind of get some feedback about it could be written in a different way for faster access. So in the presence of this cluster of KSQL DB nodes that are maintaining their own tables and views, is there some assisting for query planning, optimization, and all of that? Yeah, it, um, you know, we have a little bit of functionality to, to let you understand what's going on under the hood. It's, it's not as mature, I think, as the more mature databases and what they provide. You know, some of that is because the, the pull queries themselves are actually simpler uh, in terms of what we support. So there's less to debug there. What you actually need in addition to that is, is you know, the ability to really change and evolve queries in a way you wouldn't in a relational database, right? Because if you have a, a query that just happens for a point in time and then is done, then uh, you don't really need to evolve it in place. But with stream processing, you have these queries that might run forever, right? So if I'm computing, you know, how many sales happened in each city, at some point, my logic for how I count that or how I define cities might change. And so, so in addition to the kind of explain plan stuff, what, what you also need is the ability to go back and reprocess data. And that's something we put some thought into uh, there's kind of ongoing work to help with that kind of query evolution, make it easier to do that in place without having to go back and reprocess data. So that's that's kind of an interesting nuance as well. And when it comes to actually accessing your data, since you have a cluster, is there a way to find the table or do you need to know exactly where that node is, its IP address or a DNS lookup name or whatever? Yeah, the um, the interaction with KSQL DB is very, very similar to most of the relational databases. So if you've used MySQL or Postgres or Oracle, you know, you, you there's a little command line shell that you can hook up with. Uh, there's a REST API, but on the command line shell, you can do exactly what you would expect, which is 
you know, show me the tables, show me the streams. Uh, I want to do this. You can kind of interactively develop these queries, see what the results of different things would be, you know, run these queries. You can manage some of the background queries, like kill the, you know, kill the long running ones. So, you know, it's very similar to those systems and what it provides. Do you have any comments on performance of KSQL DB and how quickly you can ingest things um, in comparison with, say, a relational database? What's stopping or why use KSQL DB over, say, a relational database that could be ingesting the same amount of data every event that comes in? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, so, so yeah, you know, if, if what you're building is ultimately, you know, a UI-driven app where there's a pile of data that kind of sits there and you just do lookups to show the result, then I, th I think that well, then, you know that's that's effectively what a relational database is built to do, and they, they do it pretty well. And there's different you know there's 101 databases, there's probably one that's a good fit for whatever the application you're building is. Um, and I, I don't know that there's really a motivation to adopt anything new. This other side of things around stream processing, you know that's something that databases don't do at all. Uh, and so you are, you end up pushed into this world where you're you know like in the data warehouse world, you dump a bunch of data in. And then at the end of the day, you run some big batch computation to get it into shape. So everything's like a day old. And you know, that's that's nowhere right in the modern world. That's that's where stream processing shines. So I would say the you know the goal of adopting this is not so much that uh, Postgres wasn't fast enough. It's actually that you know the, the application you're building is actually a stream processing application. You're reacting to things as they occur. And you know, there's a lot of use cases that just require that uh, that kind of access pattern. So then, um, you know, how, how does the performance compare? Yeah, it's hard to compare because they don't, you know, these other systems don't do stream processing. So, you know, the KSQL DB just does relatively simple lookups. So, so the typical, like, you know, if you, if you ran it through one of these data, data warehouse uh, query benchmarks, it, like it couldn't do most of the queries in that. It just does sim simple lookups right on the pull query side. So the pull queries are fast, but not uh, nearly as expressive yet. Uh, that's an area we're adding. And then, of course, the stream processing doesn't exist at all in those, those other systems. So, so it's probably hard to do apples to apples comparison. In terms of raw performance of, you know, how, how, what can you use this on? You know, there's, there's kind of a per node number, which is actually quite good. You can, you can process, you know, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of records per second on one node. But, but like a lot of these modern systems, it's a proper distributed system and it scales horizontally. So you could add, you know, if you want more, then you just add more machines. Uh, and you can do that uh, dynamically as it runs. So as you know, as the query is processing, you can add more uh, capacity to make it go faster. So so we you know we've run on workloads that, that are actually massive in scale, where it's you know millions of uh, records per second. That's great. So in Kafka, you could have older events sort of expiring or falling off of the topic. So how does that flow back into KSQL DB? Let's say I have some expiration that says, um, just forget about events from 30 days ago for compliance or whatever. How does that flow into your KSQL DB instance in terms of the aggregates you're computing or uh, the transformations that you've done on top of the underlying data? Yeah, you're saying maybe we can start that one over. I'm not sure if I understood the question. So you're saying like the compliance of the data, the retention. Uh, so retention. Let's let's say retention yeah. of data and topics. You can configure that, right? So um, since you have these push queries or pull queries, do you actually see data twice when things sort of are deleted because of retention policies? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So you know, in a stream, you would have this idea of maintaining you know data just for some period of time. Uh, in theory, that period of time could be forever. But if that's the case, you're going to need more storage over time as more data accumulates. In a table, uh, it works uh, just like a database does. So, you know, the table data is stored forever. So if you have your customer accounts, the assumption is you, you wouldn't ever, you know, time out, you know, your customer account that would stay forever. Uh, you, under the hood, uh, we do actually support kind of a, a time model table. Um, that's important for some of the windowing concepts. You know, as you compute aggregates over a window, like how many uh, people were born in last however many days. But the, at least in the common case, you could think of uh, tables as being just like a database table where it persists until you delete it. So internally, was there any reason you chose RocksDB? What was, uh, what was the motivation behind that? Yeah, um, you know, effectively, we're, we're using, you know, just kind of a, uh, some key, persistent key value interface. And, and so it doesn't particularly matter what that key value interface is. And so there's there's a set of these different embeddable key value interfaces that run as libraries. 
Um, it would be overkill to have something that had like a SQL layer of its own or a bunch of advanced database features. It, it literally is just a library that we use for maintaining data on disk. And uh, all the distributed systems, replication of data, SQL processing, that's all done uh, by KSQL DB itself. So, so yeah, then when, then when you look at different libraries, they, they all have pluses and minuses. Um, technically, it's actually pluggable with, within Kafka Streams, which is, is used for these underlying primitives. And so you can actually plug in anything you want. There's an there's a all-in-memory version of it um, that could have some advantages. Um, there's other systems out there you could adopt, but most people use RocksDB. It's, it's um, you know, there's pros and cons. It's, uh, I think, extremely uh, featureful and um, very high performance. You know, the con is it has about a million tuning knobs. So, uh, there, you know, there, there's, uh, if you don't like the performance, you can almost certainly fix it if you can discover the right, the right tuning knob. So operationally, how is this packaged along with Kafka? Do I need to manage a separate Rocks DB instance, tune it, and all of that, or is it just out of the box? It's available. No, no. So, so um, you know, I think you, you guys did a, a podcast on Cockroach DB. They they use it as well, right? So for for both of us, mm -hmm. the the word DB and Rocks DB is is maybe a misnomer. It, it is actually just a library, and it accesses mm -hmm. the local disk, and so it's uh, you know it's it's really just a, a library that that maintains a certain file format on disk. It, it, uh, it's not something you would install separately. It's not something that's accessed remotely over a network. It's not something that has a SQL interface. So, you know, anything which accesses data on disk, you have to pay a little more attention to, but, but yeah, there's no operational component of it. Effectively, you start this uh, KSQL DB process and it has everything it, it needs. You know, what you have to tell KSQL DB is where's Kafka? And um, you know that's that's really the 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 things you have to have is is Kafka and KSQL. Are there any anti patterns of using KSQL DB for stream processing, such as building a push based application, for example, using Kafka Stream API versus KSQL DB? Are there anti patterns of using one over the other um, where it's not compatible? Yeah, pr probably the probably the biggest anti pattern in stream processing, I think, is you know, trying to do uh, remote lookups for every record. And so this is kind of a very natural thing in software uh, where, you know, if you have one thing and you want to look up the corresponding record, you do some remote call to get that corresponding record. So in the example I gave, I had the sale, I want to look up the customer record. Um, there's a tendency for engineers to want to you know, take each thing and do a remote call on the other thing. And it usually just isn't the easiest, most correct or most performant way to do that because you have to reason about, well, what happens if that call fails and how do I retry it and all this stuff. So the, the more natural way of doing that in KSQL DB would be to capture the stream of changes on the customer data and capture the stream of sales and then do that join within KSQL rather than trying to do it in the application space itself. Um, that will that will kind of have the right properties around reasoning about time. It'll have the right fault tolerance properties, and it'll be a lot faster uh, because you're not kind of doing a remote call on each item uh, with all the kind of latency and whatever that that implies. So that's probably the biggest anti pattern that people miss, which is just a little different from how people use uh, traditional databases, where you're often joining you're doing joins kind of in your code over the network between different things, and it works better because you're you're typically just doing that for one or two rows. Whereas in stream processing, there's a whole feed of these. And especially when you go to rerun your processing, if you change your logic, you want it to, to work quickly so you can get back caught up mm -hmm. to the current time. So what's the future of KSQL DB? Where is it going? Yeah, um, well, well, you know, our, our goal is to really make working with streams of events as easy as possible. So, and, and that's really our vision at Confluent kind of end to end. And so there's, there's a lot of work to try and make that easy. Like we're, you know, we're building all this as a cloud service to try and make the operation side of it go away. Um, it's, you know, making all the features uh, available that just make it really easy to work with this and make it easy to work across a large company. Um, so in KSQL DB, the, the parts of that that are important, um, I mentioned just completing the set of functionality that people want in pull queries. That's a ton of work because it's like all the stuff databases do. Uh, so we got, you know, a long roadmap of things to fill out that side of things. You know, we're still not trying to replace traditional databases for, you know, what they're good at, like building kind of end-to-end UI-driven apps, but we want to make these 
you know, event stream processing architectures really simple and make the access to that data really easy in an integrated system. Um, th there's work going on around making it really easy to test and evolve these queries, the kind of full life cycle uh, of development for it. And then a ton of work on just the, the full completeness of, of all the processing capabilities, performance, all the operational side of it. So, you know, lots going on. Uh, I guess whenever you're trying to build a database, it's, it's a lot of work. So, so we're, we're not running out of things to do. So is KSQL DB open source? Yeah, it's available under the community license that Confluent uses. And so um, it's not an OSI open source license, but you can take it, you can modify the code, you don't have to pay us anything. You know, you can make changes to it and publish those. The, the only uh, major restriction is around um, how that can be run as part of a uh, kind of managed SaaS cloud service, um, which you know, that right is reserved. All, all the details are in the, the license itself. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the same license that we produce our schema registry and other components under. And it's, it's very popular and, you know, um, gets a lot of, mm -hmm. of free usage. And of course, you can do exactly what you'd expect, which is go look at it all on GitHub and, and make your own fork of that. Awesome. So is there anything else that you want to add about KSQL DB? Uh, no, I, I think it's, you know, if you're interested in, in databases and data systems, I, I think this world of events and event streaming is is really becoming a big deal. You know, it's, it's kind of becoming part of the modern stack. And I, I think it's a great tool to make working with this really easy and productive. So I'd urge people to go check it out and, and give it a spin. You know, you can try it out pretty easily. And there's a pretty active community around it. So, you know, if you kick the tires and there, there's something that doesn't make sense or, or doesn't work the way you expect, let us know. Um, there, there's a set of people contributing patches and, and, and a bunch of people at Confluent working on it actively. So we'd love to hear feedback from people. I'll include some notes in the show notes on how people can try KSQL DB. With that, Jay, uh, thanks for being here to talk about KSQL DB. This is Akshay Manchale for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much for having me. InterSystems Iris is the fastest way to build applications. So take advantage of that extra time on your hands and use it to learn a new data platform. Deliver complex mission-critical applications on the fastest route possible with data from any source, embedded analytics, and interactive user interfaces. With InterSystems Iris, you can connect your systems, use any data model, and apply machine learning. Now's the time to level up your database platform and try out InterSystems Iris so you can collaborate, build, and deploy faster than ever before. Don't wait any longer. Level up your skills with InterSystems Iris. Ready, set, code. Visit intersystems.com slash try Iris to learn more. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.